Hey, everybody, it's Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the show uh, where I just talk to other writers and always have a good time. Pretty much always have a good time. Sometimes it's a little bit of a train wreck. But generally speaking, it's pretty, these people are pretty awesome. Um, who was awesome today was uh, my guest, James Byrne. Uh, now, I didn't know James, um, and, and he came on my radar, and we connected, and I was very happy to be able to interview him. Um, he lives in Portland, and uh, you know he's published under various names. Um, but he's published nine other novels uh, under under various names, and his recent book is uh, under the name of James Byrne is The Gatekeeper, a thriller. Um, so thriller writer and and also a journalist as well. Um, he uh, he was interesting to talk to. He wrote his first book in his uh, early twenties and um, sold three, and kind of was on this roll. And then he had a fifteen year dry spell, and that's <laughs> that's what happens when you're a writer. Like you, it's it's you know everything is transient nothing nothing is permanent um and you you might have initial success and then a long dry spell you might in my case like not sell anything for a long time and then had a string of, of novels uh sell so it all depends um uh, what's also interesting about james is he writes he writes in longhand in the morning and then um uh, puts it all on the computer uh in the evening which which works for him. It, it, to me, that sounds terrible. <laughs> I, I write about three seconds in long hand and my hand starts cramping up. Um, but that's his process and that's what works for him. Um, but he had, he, he's had a really interesting journey as a writer and, and, um, it was good to connect with him and, and to connect with another thriller writer. So I think you're going to like this one. This is my conversation with James Byrne. So how are you? You're you look like you're in an, a muted area. Are you? You must be in Oregon. <laughs> I am in Oregon. I am doing quite well. I have to, my uh, day job is as a journalist. I'm gonna actually hide this. Is that like uh, is that like secret information that we're not supposed to see? Sometimes we write obscenities on that list. It's things that we're doing that we're working on. Sometimes they're quite obscene. <laughs> that would be highly welcome here. Well, I got to say, it's my day job. My photographer, Jaime, and I just got back from Cirque du Soleil. Uh, it's going to open tomorrow here in Portland, and we got a backstage tour, and we got to interview aerialists. Ah. So I'm totally living my best life, man. This is great. How? What? Uh, what show was it? Like, what was the theme of the Cirque du Soleil? It was Allegria, which is one of their oldest shows, dates back from '95, and they were on hiatus for uh, during the pandemic, and now they're back. Awesome, awesome. And and so, what kind of? Tell me about um, your journalism. Like, what is your role? Uh, I am currently the editor-in-chief of the Portland Tribune, which is one of 25 weeklies and monthly papers, and mostly in the Portland metropolitan area, but around the rest around Oregon as well. And I'm the managing editor for all 25 and the executive editor for our paper. And um, I don't usually uh, cherry pick all the best assignments, but <laughs> we also wanted to go see Allegra backstage. And I thought, oh, my God, I wouldn't turn this one down for anything. So. Yeah, I think you I think you get senior enough that you can cherry pick all you want. I don't think anyone's going to have a problem with that. That's, have you so have you been in Oregon all your life a long time? Born in the Pacific Northwest, born in Idaho, raised in uh, Washington for a while, lived in Portland or the Portland suburbs since 80. Uh, my wife is Portland born and raised, so I feel like I've been uh, here long enough to start thinking of myself as, as a local. Love Portland, adore Portland. Katie and I live downtown uh, yeah, in an apartment, and it is it is an amazing place to live. Yeah, I mean, that's that's how I, I, I'm just outside of Boulder, Colorado, and I've been here 25 years. So, um, you know, certainly not all my life by any means, about half my life. And, but it feels like I've been here my whole life. And, and you know, with the exception of all the smoke and the heat we're having now, it, it's hard to imagine uh, going somewhere else. But, you know, Oregon is a kindred spirit to, to Colorado for sure. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, when you're as you were kind of growing up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, so you had siblings or what were your parents doing? Yeah, my mom and dad, uh, dad's a teacher, mom uh, mostly stayed at home. Uh, I have three siblings and we all went into vastly different fields. 
my older brother's a lawyer and my younger sister studied to be an educator and then became a mom instead. And my younger brother's an educator. He's a high school teacher, as is his wife. Uh, and we've all stayed in the Northwest. I mean, they, those two of them live in Idaho, where I'm from originally, and my sister lives here in the Portland area with me. So none of us have strayed geologically very far <laughs> from where we started. And we all have vastly different skill sets and different careers. So it's That's interesting. Well, it sounds like a lot of people are in, in the, you know, a lot of them are in education. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just nothing that kind of, you know, lured you. No, I'll tell you what, I wanted to be, when I was 20, I wanted to be a journalist or a novelist. And I had one great, like, you know, everybody I've ever, ever interviewed, anybody in any artistic field, they always say, well, there was this one great teacher in high school. And I was the same way. I had a journalism teacher who taught us to associate a press style. So by the time I got to college, I knew AP style, which is a way of writing. Sure. And of course, nobody else did. And so I was immediately the editor of my community college paper and then an editor of my college paper and got a job right out of uh, journalism at a small weekly here in the Portland area. So, mm -hmm. so, so journalism was, that was an elective, I guess, in high school. I mean, even to teach yeah. journalism in high school is, um, Maybe nowadays it's maybe more common, but certainly that wasn't something that I don't think I could have taken back in high school. Do you remember like why you picked that class? I was a storyteller. I wanted to tell stories and I thought this was a class in which I was just going to be able to put my hands to the keyboard. And by the way, it was a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, it was going to be great. I thought that I get to tell stories. I would love to do that job. So by that time, you already knew you were calling yourself a storyteller. How was that manifesting itself prior to that as a child, as an early teenager? When you say you were storytelling, what does that mean? Um, from about 12 on, I was a comic book collector and I had, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to become a comic book professional. Note, I have not done so and still dream about doing it. <laughs> uh, so early on that. Secondly, my dad uh, was an avid uh, fan of action, mystery, thriller novels like Bo Jest and Gunga Din and The yeah. Four Feathers and that kind of stuff. And so he he got me interested in the, those kinds of books. So by the time I was in a at a community college at age 19, I started thinking to myself, I wonder if I can write a novel and started playing with one. So um, early on, I, before I turned 20, I was thinking, could, do I have the chops? Could I do that? Because I've been reading all of these action adventure mystery novels all these years. All these years, meaning about like six. <laughs> right, right. 19, it feels like forever, right? And uh, so I tried my very first novel when I was still a student at the community college and stupidly, ridiculously Bantam bought it. And I was published before I made it over to Lewis and Clark College. Sharon. All right, that's crazy. So, all right, I'm going to back up a little bit. So, first of all, you, the I, you know, you have a little bit of this journalism background. You know, as you're approaching your first novel, mystery thriller, you know, the 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 people who I've talked to who you know have been journalists or are still journalists, it's just they love those books that require a lot of research. Um, was that you? Did you? I mean, were you able to kind of parlay a lot of what you've studied um, into writing that first novel? No, very, very little. Uh, and um, uh, I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing with the first novel. So I decided to set it in Portland, Oregon. And I said, I just set it at a college campus, making an academic mystery because I was on a college campus in Portland. So thus I had to do no research, right? And it was just a body shows up. There's a, there are two protagonists. One's a professor of political science, which was my major. One's a journalist, which was my career goal. So the, my, my first book was completely orbited around the fact that I'm the laziest person in the world. And I want to do the least amount of research. That's just me. That's exactly me. I hate research. <laughs> I avoid any kind of storyline that really requires it, honestly. Like I, I, and I think the people who really do a lot of the research, they love it. That's why, you know, it's not like they have, they love it. And they research way more than they need to actually, you know, show oh, yeah. off in their books. Um, but they, and, and I'm exactly the opposite of that. I, I, to me, it's tedious and uninteresting for the most part. And I should, uh, what I will do when I'm working on a first draft of a book, I will get to something I need to do some research for, and I'll make myself a bracketed note that says, research this later. Right. So I don't right. need to know it in advance. I just later I can go and figure out whatever that was to make, to give it stuff. Right. Present. When you're in that mood. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, so how did you know, you know, so you write your first book when you're in your early twenties, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, 
how did you know about the publishing process, how to find, did you go out and find an agent? And if so, how did you know how to do that? Um, because that seems to stop a lot of people. It's like, you know, not, there's so much information now on the internet, but, but years ago it was like, what do, <laughs> how do I do this? Yeah, it was pure dumb luck that has a huge part of it. Um, I wrote this book and I thought, eh, it's not terrible. And um, I went into the library and I got the the literary list of literary agents, you know, and all uh, it's got every agent in the genre in which they work. This is all online today, but at the time you had to get from your library. And I figured, you know, you have nothing to fear but postage itself. So I just sent off three letters a week for 11 months, just peppered the world until I found somebody who said, yeah, you know, I'll go ahead and look at your manuscript. She got it. She was an agent in Jer New Jersey. And as luck would have it, Bantam Books, paperback house at the time, had no mystery line of its own. It had Agatha Christie, I think. So they decided we need our own, our own mystery line. Let's open the valve and bring some in. So mine came over the transom, as did Robert Cray, as mm. did, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of people who made it really, really big. They ended up buying three of my books over time, and, and they did all right. They were mid-list books, uh, and no more than that but amongst my uh, that uh, inaugural class was sue graft so they kept sue <laughs> and, they, and they kept robert cray and the rest of us they said mazel tov. yeah was was that under your name or under a, a pen name i was under a pen name i wrote under conrad haynes at the time uh and then uh, uh and then i have and i'll tell your audience after those three books i had a dry spell in which i couldn't get published that lasted for 15 years. Yeah. So from book three to book four was a 15 year uh, walk through the desert. So, so, so a couple of things I want to explore. First of all, why did you, what was the thought process for starting with the pen name? Um, very foolishly, I, <laughs> I, I didn't want, I really wanted to have a career in journalism and I didn't want people thinking, oh yes, that fiction writer is coming to interview me for the newspaper. So I thought it'd be a good idea to bifurcate my <laughs> writing files into two names. In retrospect, that was probably silly, but that's that was my idea to start with. I probably wouldn't do that for the same reasons today, but at the time it seemed that I, the different, you, you, you wanna bring a certain aura to yourself as you walk into a room near a reporter than you do when you're not, so. Right. And you were oh, under sorry. the assumption that you would be so famous as a writer <laughs> that like, oh, my God, the James Byrne is coming to interview. Me today. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's precisely what I feared. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, I'm you know, the only times I've contemplated changing my name is like just like if the books aren't selling well enough, like, oh, no one's going to, you know, no publisher is going to want my next one. So I'm going to have to change my name. Fortunately, it hasn't gotten to that point. <laughs> At one, at one point, uh, uh, one of the houses who was publishing my books, this was uh, Minotaur, asked me, do you want to use a pen name? And I said, yes, I'd like to use the name Oprah Winfrey Presents. <laughs> the legal department got back to me and said, don't even joke about that. <laughs> oh, wow. Not even to joke. Like, yeah. I thought you were going to say you couldn't do it, but the, <laughs> but it was I, the lawyers who got back to me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I guess you I learned. So, so that they did three books and then there was a 15 year lull what is happening during that lull? Did you actually have a fourth book that you were shopping for 15 years or were you working on other stuff? Many, I would write a book and not get any traction. I write a book and not get any traction. I changed literary agents a few times and it just wasn't going anywhere. Then in 1999, I wanted to write a book called Crashers, which was about the NTSB investigation team that shows up when an airplane falls out of the sky. Hmm. And you know, it's pilots and 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 engineers and the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder and pathologists all these people come together to figure out why a major airliner fell and i really want to do this book so i got working on that book worked on it for two years which by the way that sounds like a shit ton of research <laughs> it was just yeah there was an insane amount of research i had to figure out how engines work and how oh. thrust reversers uh -huh. work you know and i have a bachelor's degree in political science right so this is way out of my league and uh that was finally the book that uh, Minotaur picked up that ended my long, long drought. So, okay, okay. So then that was with Minotaur, and then what? And you know, I, I think this is kind of interesting to explore with the audience for the audience, like changing literary agents. So I've been with my same agent for the whole time, so nearly twenty years. Um, but people change agents all the time. What was your kind of what was your thought process around that? 
Uh, the, the first literary agent I had dropped me when she couldn't sell any of my books. She said, I think I've taken you as far as I can. We probably ought to part ways. And I had an anxiety attack. I was sure. Yeah. Lying on my, in the fetal position. Even though she had sold three books. Right. But then she was unable to sell like the next four. Yeah. So yeah. So she said, no, I'm going to part ways. And then if there's anybody in the publishing industry that ever tells your audience or anybody that, you know, luck isn't involved, it's, it's all hard work and, and talent. There's no luck there. They're just lying because <laughs> incredibly important. I had this book crashers started sending out query letters to New York city over and over and over and over again. And one of the literary agents in New York city called me and said, I recognize your name. You didn't work for the Westland Tidings in Westland, Oregon, did you? I used to live there. Oh, my God. And I said, yeah, that was me. She said, I hated your paper. Sure, I'll look at your manuscript. Wow. And she's the one who sold every book of mine since then, Janet Reed of Jet Reed Literary. Oh. But she used to be, she used to live in Westland, which is a suburb of Portland. And she she had seen my byline and my little newspaper. And, and the pure luck of that, she was yeah. in Brooklyn at the time saying, yeah, I'll take a look at your book. I hated your paper. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that luck or fate, right? Because it's the same thing with like, we, you mentioned that one teacher and that story I hear all the time. There was that one teacher and it's never a class that they were done. It was just a class that like, I almost didn't take this class, you know, and then that class be, led to their whole career. So it, it is almost like, it, you know, after doing dozens of these interviews, I kind of feel like if you're a writer, you can't help, but somehow get out there even if you're trying not to you're eventually it could be 20 years down the line something's going to happen where you're going to get a book out and it, because it just seems like it's just fated for that to happen it does feel that way it yeah. does it, it does completely um so but meantime you're still working as a journalist and um you know what is kind of is does there become kind of a, a, a mashup between your your, your journalistic career and your writing? Do you see like, you know, leaning on one for the other? Are they both helping you become a better writer? A uh, couple of interesting answers that way that they are so vastly different. Yeah, they're so phenomenally different that actually writing fiction feels like a catharsis at the end of 12 hours of writing Associated Press style and inver inverted pyramid. And he said, she said, you know, uh, which is very stultifying. And then you go home and work on your fiction and you can take that redhead and turn her into a blonde because you're God. You can change anything you want. You, <laughs> right. You own the facts and it's very, it's very relaxing. But there's a couple of things I've really noticed. I was out on an assignment today. Uh, with my photographer and I see little small weird details because I'm a novelist that I would never see if I wasn't like so what? I think that that um, I, as we as we walked into the set for Cirque du Soleil which has just hit town they're still building the sets they're not completely up yet I just happened to notice that the hurricane fencing around the the expo center was at just the right height that one of the panels would have a woman's eyes looked like she was looking over the top of it and she was <laughs> doing the Kilroy is here thing and right. I saw a photo of that and I it, it's a detail that may or may not get it into my get into my story I don't know but I definitely I, it was just that image that I thought I would have as a novelist I would have picked up on that and then when I'm when I'm interviewing people I tend to hear them as dialogue. And I think, oh, that thing the guy just said, that's really interesting. Let me hearken back to that in a second when he's done with this conversation that I don't think I would have done had I not taught myself to think in terms of dialogue, not just transcribing answers from sources. Well, and dialogue is so interesting because if you actually do kind of just overhear a conversation and if you were to write that verbatim it would be garbage <laughs> i mean mostly it would just be so fragmented and fractured and, and probably uninteresting um so you you know for me i can get distracted by the reality of dialogue versus like what i think pops on a page and what flows on a page and and dealing with interruptions and, and things like that so i tend not to have that stuff influenced me. I think what influences me the most is I just tend to think somebody's going to do something awful at, at any moment of it. Go oh, that that guy's that guy's going to snap <laughs> just because most of my characters are like that. So so and, I, I, and you kind of write dark, right? So you know when you you know you're 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 writing, you know. I assume fairly action heavy thrillers. Yeah. Where does that interest come from for you? I mean, that because that goes all the way back to your first book. Um, uh, my pivot foot is still thoroughly in the world of mysteries. I want somebody to do done it and then the 
hero or heroine figure out who done it. So that's sort of still the baseline. But I write books with me as the first audience. I write books that I would read. Right. I want to be able to write a book that, that makes me wake up and say, man, I put my protagonist in a weird situation. I can't wait to figure out how she gets out of this. I really want to be able to do that. And if I'm 40 or 50 pages in and I'm not feeling that, the book isn't working and I need to trash it and move on. The book that just came out, the protagonist was in his 30s and then he was in his 50s and then he was in his 60s. He was an American and then he wasn't. He was in law enforcement and then he wasn't. He was a criminal and he wasn't. I, I hid it from every conceivable angle till I figured out he was from uh, the United Kingdom and he has an English accent and he's 35. And as soon as I knew that, the book took off and I was having that feeling of, wow, I can't wait to see what happens next. But until I had that feeling, it wasn't worth it wasn't happening. It wasn't. But it's so yeah, that's so interesting, because there's so much work to get to that point. I'm a little bit of the opposite of that. So I don't outline or anything. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next. And and like you, that's the discovery that I love. And I am writing for myself. That's where I derive the joy. I think one of the downsides of that is like you can finish a book that you love and it might not be at all what your agent or editor is expecting. Do you run into that at all if you're if you're kind of focusing on yourself as your audience? Yeah, I've had, I've, I have written stories and I had Janet come back to me and say, that's really well written. I cannot sell that. Um, <laughs> like sell it from the perspective of like who you are as an author and and what your name you know, is, is meant for, or, or just like, she doesn't represent, maybe you wrote quote unquote, a literary novel. Uh, she, she has tried to push out some of my books. This is going to sound terrible. And I hate to say this out loud. I'm going to do it anyway. She told me early on, um, you can't have an action adventure book with a female protagonist unless you want mediocre sales. And I said, that's hmm. not true. And I'm going to prove to you. So I wrote a uh, couple of them that um, that were at, at Minotaur and they had really mediocre sales. And then I wrote another one that I thought was pretty good and she was gonna get me a bid on it from a publisher and the bid was really low. It was a low, you know, it was a week's worth of groceries. Um, and, and, and I wanted to say to her, no, I refuse to believe that you can't have a female protagonist in action adventure and sell well. And she said, oh, okay, well, you're probably right. I'm probably wrong. Go ahead and tell me about the action adventure films out of Hollywood for the last 10 years that have been blockbusters. And I was like, ah, yes, um, shoot, there are none. There are some that I liked. I thought the Charlie's Angels relaunch was a lot of grand fun. I thought I thought sure. uh, Atomic Blonde was grand fun and they were all mediocre uh, box office hits. So son of a gun, <laughs> I realized that she's right. And I have to say for the first time in my life at my grand old age with my, with my gray hair that I am now cognizant of trying to write books that will meet the expectations of the publishers and the buyers of books. So I'm thinking about the marketing the first time ever. Yeah, and, and and that's not to say you shouldn't be. I mean, I think you absolutely should be. I mean, I'll be writing stuff and I'll just I'll hear my my agent's voice in my head, and be like, oh, she's gonna fucking hate this, you know. <laughs> but and, and I know I'm gonna have to change it. But it and, and I'm going through that right now. I'm going through some major, major, massive edits on something that was, you know, just a, I wanted to write this weird, quirky story about this 21 year old woman in 1987. So really, like, <laughs> very odd. But um, you know, but now I'm paying the price for it, but I'm still having fun with it. But it's it's true. You have to. And I wonder if that in your case, if that's because when you look at readership, especially with thrillers, you could really you can really split it up into groups. Right. So I write mostly domestic, dark, psychological thrillers, heavy, mm -hmm. heavy female readership. Um, yep. When you're talking about action and adventure or financial thrillers, that's a very heavy, I assume, a very heavy male readership and maybe that's why there's the desire for a male protagonist yep that's exact that's it exactly so when this book came about um the at my editor at, at saint martin's uh, minotaur contacted janet and said i'm looking for a book with a male single male protagonist action adventure i'd really love to pick one up does, does your client have one of these and she contacted me and i said yeah as luck would have it i actually have been playing with one that i can have ready in in a matter of weeks, I think. And so, um, but this was an, an, this was the first time ever that a publisher said, this is the genre that I'm looking for. I'm looking to buy something in there. Huh. Can you, can you thread that needle? And I, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist. So I was like, of course I can write anything. I'm not going to write it on a deadline. So if you want me to, I can do that. 
So that's why this one came about because it was very specifically to match the expectations of Keith Kayla, who is this brilliant editor at Minotaur. It makes every book better. Truly, guys, guys, wonderful to work with. So if you wanted that kind of book, I said, yeah, I could do that. I ha actually have one in my head that is in, in pretty good phase. Let, let me try it. That That's interesting. So when you have, and I haven't ever had that happen where it's like, you know, you know, almost like spec writing, you know, can you, you know, how do you balance that you know, uh, the enjoyment and the joy. So you must have like, I feel comfortable with like this given I, this is what they want, but this isn't my wheelhouse and I would enjoy writing this as opposed to saying something that maybe you could do, but it's not something you would have fun writing is, was that a, a balance for you at all? Yeah, it was. And I started, you know, there's some, there are some action adventure novels that I think are really well written. They're just terrific. And but I don't think I could write them necessarily. And quite often there's a very brooding damaged hero uh, who is uh, laboring under all these stressors. And I thought about it, I thought about it for a long time, but I finally decided that my protagonist was gonna be good with his fists, good with the guns, action adventure, but at the end of the day, a goofball who is mm. sort of enjoying life a great deal and is, and is um, kind of optimistic and buoyant and and a, a bit of an idiot sometimes uh, and whose English is bad. He's got really bad street English and uh, doesn't particularly care. And when we first meet him, he's got a guitar in Los Angeles and he's picking up gigs, playing music, you know, as a session musician. And he, he's not looking for trouble, trouble simply finds him. But I thought, okay, now this guy's gonna be fun because this guy is not brooding in the slightest. This guy is not nearly as fun, he, not as funny as he thinks he is. He thinks he's really funny, and he's and uh, when when trouble comes his way, he can clearly handle it. But he's not looking for it. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think I'm always thinking about like how do I go against type um, because that's more interesting. But it does get you into trouble, even with that. So you know, I I you know, even just going a little bit outside the box can be great and it can be problematic because readers have definite expectations and if they're like why is this guy a goofball i you know <laughs> that's not my that's not my expectation it could backfire but apparently you know that wasn't a problem for this book the other thing i really really wanted to do um and i'd never seen it before and i and i hope it works i don't know that it does is i want him to be the least cool dude in the world when it comes to women and sex so like when a woman propositions him his first reaction is sex that would be brilliant. I'd love to do that. Oh, oh yeah, huh? And he's like a 15 year old instantaneously when there's an opportunity. And he's like so non James Bond, so non cool about it. That's so funny. Um, but the, but he has skills. Yeah, I mean, just and that's like, well, so, that, so that's what makes it exciting when those skills, you know, it, it come out. You're like, holy shit, this is <laughs> this is a badass. Like I'd almost forgotten. And, and now all of a sudden he starts taking care of business. But that, yeah, there, there's a show called The Patriot. I, I forget what network it was on. Um, they had a couple seasons of it. And it was just, it, the guy wasn't a goofball, but it was so not an action hero kind of guy. And it was so quirky. It was brilliant. It was really well done. But I don't think it, I don't know what the viewership was. It probably wasn't for me because it was so outside the box, but yet it was an action adventure. And I always, I always loved to see that happen. But I feel like, you know, then the world gets overrun with like uh, superhero movies again. <laughs> exactly. You know, and to me, that's just so boring after it like, I am yearning for something different. And I think that comes out in my writing, but I, like I said, sometimes that can, that can be a problem. Um, so are you, so I know the gatekeeper just came out like last week, right? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way, that's, does that, does that get old at all? Like, Oh, another no, one no. coming out. <laughs> it's no, exciting, no, no. right? Not this, I, I told a cashier in a safe way. Uh, you know, I have a book out. She's at eighty-seven, ninety-five. You know, she's, she's right, she's, right. <laughs> yeah, but it'd be great to see it in Safeway. That would be really something. Then you could point it out to her. And I, do you ever go by those aisles? And she's like, "Why is my book not here?" <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, constantly. Yeah. Like or airports. And I'm like, I know that the real estate's small here, but you know, just one copy that would be kind of nice to see. And that is exciting when you oh. do see. You're like, "Holy shit!" I wasn't expecting that. Oh, I know. Yeah. The first time you ever see a stranger, like in a coffee shop reading your book, I completely freaked out. I had an aneurysm. It was like, uh, it was the most unmanly squeal any human has ever given in public space. It was, uh, it was so exciting the first time you see somebody reading your thing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a, that's a great feeling for sure. Now, are you, 
so you know what you you know the 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 genre within which you write lends itself very easily and well to series um is is gatekeeper part of a series or are you you're more interested in standalones it's a series the second one is written and with my editor at st martin's i'm 200 pages into the third one. Oh wow uh, and i have to tell you honestly i'm having a lot of fun writing this guy i mean his dialogue comes really easily if i if i'm smart enough to step out of the way he writes his own dialogue and i'm having tremendous fun with it so when they so now it's it's, it's kind of fascinating because now you have three books out of this one person saying i'm looking for a book with this kind of protagonist and all of a sudden you've, you've got three books did you pitch that as a series because it's always it's always the catch-22 of like well we don't really want to commit to a series because we don't know how the first book's going to sell yet you know et cetera, et cetera. so from the get-go was it going to be a series or based on kind of their anticipated sales you thought it would be good to continue it like a trapeze artist i ended <laughs> on an upswing so that it could lend itself to a, a, a second book, but it certainly was the cliffhanger. Yeah. It was like, this story has ended. There's a beginning and middle and end. This is the ending of the story. And the potential for another story is that there, if, if sales are good, if the publisher wants it, it's gonna not be, it's gonna be organic to have another one. And if they don't, the story actually, you know, has a the end and the story ends. Uh, the, the monster doesn't rise at, in the last frame. Right. Uh, so, uh, I set myself up so that if they wanted it, it would be available. And as luck would have it, they bought it as a two book contract. They said, we like this, get us another one. Oh, okay. Okay. That's awesome. And are you finding, you know, it sounds like you're having a great time with this guy, but are you finding like, okay, how many more things can he get involved with? <laughs> nope. No, it's not. I'm not finding that problem at all. And my, my thesis of this guy is, although we don't know much about his background is that he had a had a career in a military, we don't say which military, and he has a very specific skill set. His skill set is he's a gatekeeper. He can open any door, keep it open as long as necessary, and control who goes in and who doesn't. He's a breach artist. Hmm. So if the military is making a breach, he's the guy who can open whatever door needs to be opened and make sure it stays open as long as necessary. Given that, given that strange skill set, the number of stories I can come up with are pretty, pretty wide. I can yeah, have yeah. lots of ways in which because you know you define doors as you want. I mean, uh, he's got a tattoo of Janusz or Janus, the Roman god of of doors on his on his forearm. <laughs> Janusz was the, the god of beginnings and gates and transitions and time and dualities and doors and passages and endings. So within that frame, I can find a hell of a lot of stories. <laughs> This is not not going to be a problem. That's awesome, and you know I, I think people would be interested as well um, because I have a full time job. Also, how do you what is what does that balance look like for you? How much are you writing a day? Um, you know how do you, you know you've you've got you know a, another life outside of work that you I'm sure you want to spend time with, and how do you balance everything? Well, I have a I have a style of of fiction writing that uh, technically we refer to as stupid. It's a stupid style of writing. I'm, uh, what I mean by that is I write longhand and steno pads. Um, oh my God. Yeah. So uh, because <laughs> that I, just I, makes I, me nervous. <laughs> I covered a thousand school board meetings, you know, and, and yeah. city council meetings. Yeah, my yeah, yeah. So I'm really good taking, you know. So today I went to an assignment and I got there early and I had my notepad with me and I yanked it out and I wrote three pages, put it away, went in and did my assignment came out, I can do that in dentist's office. I write a hell of a lot in airports and, air, and on airplanes when we're on vacation uh, because I'm not tethered to any one space or mechanism. So I write in the morning longhand, go to work, do my day for 10, 12 hours, come home and translate it into the computer, which means in the morning I'm using my creative side and in the evening I'm using my uh, scientific side or my an analytical side. And I can say right away, boy, that stuff this morning was good. Or boy, that stuff this morning was terrible. It didn't carry any of the freight it needed to carry. It all goes away. And I can analyze it on the spot, which means I can write a 300 page novel in three months because oh, wow. I'm doing instantaneous translation of did that work or did it not? It's 12, 12 hours afterwards. I've gotten away from it. I'm no longer looking at it emotionally. And I can say, nope, didn't work. Start again. So, all right, this is pretty interesting. So when you write, when you're, when you're writing longhand, are you structuring it all or you, you, you could be a sloppy, it could be shorthand, but you're, you're, when you sit down that night, you can read it obviously, but that's where you're actually typing out, you know, <laughs> the grammar and the paragraph breaks and the dialogue, the quotes and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, yeah. And, and a couple of things I would in high school and in college and a little bit after that, I was a theater 
geek. And so I, I, I was in theater for a while and I do, I do think in act one, act two and act three, like you, I don't outline, but I always know the big inciting incident that gets me out of act one. And I kind of generally know the big inciting incident that gets me out of act two. I just don't know how the book ends. Um, so it, it, when I'm writing in the morning, I could say in this next chapter, I need to introduce this character. I need, I need to round out that theme. I need to introduce this setting that's going to come in later. I need to do one of those three things. Try and do it, see if it worked. In the evening, evening, I can tell. And I do write words like in brackets, scripto, which means he walked into a bar, scripto. Later, I'm going to describe what the damn bar looked like. I don't have to do it while I'm sitting there. Um, uh, he met a woman, scripto. I'm going to describe how tall she is, what color hair she is. I'll do all that later. I don't got to do it here. So I, it is, it's very rough. It's, it's uh, in, written in my own, you know, shorthandish thing that every reporter has. Um, uh, like you don't use any vowels, for instance, you, you're just writing consonants. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and uh, yeah. That's interesting. I, I, I just met a guy, I was at Thriller Fest a couple of weeks ago in New York City. And one guy was telling me that he just writes all the dialogue out first. Like that's all he writes is just the dialogue and they fills in everything around it. I'm like, that's the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. But for him, it, I, I guess it worked. It's kind of like a screenplay, I guess, is, is what you're essentially doing. Um, but I think, you know, what's, what, what's fascinating to me about what you're doing there is like, so you're going back 12 hours later to see if, you know, say, I don't know how much you're writing in, in, in the morning, say you wrote I don't know, a thousand words. Mm -hmm to go back and then look at it 12 hours later in the context of did this work, did this not work? I would think sometimes you wouldn't even know yet because it needs, it, it, it that, those thousand words need themselves more con, a context, you know, the next 5,000 to see if those thousand work in a way, because yep. you, you're you like almost doing a draft editing every night, yep. you know, and, and I don't know, you know, you might pick something apart, but maybe the way you originally had it would have worked better based on where you're going to write now. I don't know. It's just an interesting process. And I and I review 20 pages at a time. So if I write 20 pages, I'll I'll read it on the computer and see if they're good. I write 10 more pages and I do 11 through 30. I write 10 more pages and I read 20 through 40. Oh wow. And that, yeah, and that mechanism tells me, you know what, you're going way too slow. The pace is off or your pace is, you just did not describe that thing well enough. I don't know where he is. I can't picture it. So that mechanism allows me then to say, okay, go back now to, instead of writing five new pages today, today I'm going to go back and figure out where I went off beam 30 pages ago and put myself back on the beam. That's yeah. And I've done that before. I, I, I used to do that every hundred pages or so, but now I kind of have this thing where I feel like, you know, I don't ever look back, you know, almost okay. until I'm done, because I have this weird thing of like, you know, if, if, if what's just kind of intuitively sitting in me, uh, and, and, I'll, and, and what I remember is strong enough, it's probably the right way to go, you know, and just it kind of just let it be as organic as possible. And then go back and be like, Oh, my God, I totally named this person something else in like page three. <laughs> I forgot, you know, I, I, I find mistakes so grand, you know, but, but, you know, I think it does let kind of these, these situations come about that maybe if I was constantly looking back, I don't know if I would have gotten there. And I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's an excuse for, again, being lazy with my editing, but I have a lot of editing on the back end to do for sure. <laughs> So, well, that's awesome. Well, I, you know, we're going to, we're going to wrap up, but I, we're going to first do a, a little storytelling okay. uh, if, if you're up for it. So yeah. I have, uh, I have three books that I, I chose uh, kind of from random from my bookshelves and I'm going to have you choose one of them. And then we're going to pick a page, pick a sentence. I'll read the sentence and then we can just kind of go back and forth with what happens next. Um, I have uh, David Morrell's uh, The Protector. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stephen King's Joyland. All right. And then this is not out yet, um, uh, but Look Closer by David Ellis. I think it comes out in July or August or something like that. Um, so pick one of those. Uh, Joyland, because I read it. it. Joyland's great. I, I love Please. Joyland. I love Please. his his pulpy stuff is fantastic. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and uh, page between one and 280. <laughs> uh, so, let's go with 113. 113, OK. And then a sentence between one and say 10. Okay, we'll go with five. This is two sentences I'm gonna read because the first one's really short. Uh, so I'll read this and then just give me a few sentences, whatever you feel comfortable with, and I'll give you a few and after a couple minutes, I'll call it quits. Money mattered to him. 
I never got the sense it completely owned him, but yes, it mattered to him a great deal. Well, my, the first thing I would say is I don't think he, uh, we should be talking about his money. Money mattered to him, but it's el other people's money. So I immediately think of either that person who handles money or steals money. So what would the next, so give me a, the next sentence of the story then, based on that. Uh, um, his father's thesis was the bastards of the world shouldn't have any money. And if you could take theirs away from it, you rebalance the universe. So anytime you take a bastard's money, you're doing a mitzvah for the planet. Okay, so I'll continue the story based on that. He knew bribing wasn't going to work. Sure, money mattered to him, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't swing the pendulum as far as he needed it to swing. He was going to have to do something a little bit more drastic. He needed him out of the picture. <laughs> And there are two ways to get a person out of the picture. You either eliminate the person. I'm sorry, I'm being pinged at my computer. You either eliminate the person out of the picture or you change the picture. So, uh, and if you were writing a, if this was gonna be a classic assassination book, you'd go with the former. But if you were writing an episode of the 1972 series, Mission Impossible, you'd put a person in a fish out of water scenario that they don't understand and manipulate them. So you don't change the person, you change the picture. Change the picture. All right, so I'm going to go back to the story and say, um, knowing he had to change the picture, he decided that picture was definitely going to have to include a weapon. He looked around the room, desperate as he was, not finding anything that would work. He decided to check under the bed, and there he saw something that just could do the trick. <laughs> Oh, so good, so good. Um, oh shoot! Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think you just stumped me because I'm not sure where to go in that. My first thought was it's a weapon, but not a weapon. It's a thing that can cause lots of damage, but it's not designed to be a weapon. As luck would have it, his sister, the chef, had been over and left a meat tenderizer. <laughs> I was thinking prosthetic leg. I don't know why. <laughs> But I'm like, you look under the bed and there's like a prosthetic leg there because they're heavy and you could really swing it. <laughs> and, and it and it could do some damage, but and it would probably make for 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 some kind of good finishing line. I don't know what that line would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, that's fun. That's fun. We'll wrap it up there. So, you know, so you so um, Gatekeeper just came out last week and then number two in the series is maybe sometime next year. Yep, that's the plan. That's great. That's great. Well, congratulations on all the success. And, and, and now I think, you know, the listeners will be will love to hear that there was a 15 year uh, dry spell because that is not uncommon at all. And I think that um, oh. is, is good to see, like, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You just keep writing, you know, keep at it and, you know, good things will happen eventually. So I truly believe that. And, and, and a lot of it is luck or fate or whatever. Um, but, you know, you take what you can get. <laughs> And a lot of it is, is sitting down and doing the job. You can't fix what's not on paper. So sitting your butt down and, and, and working on the story is every bit as important as getting lucky. Right. And don't wait for the muse. That's what I always say. Like some days, <laughs> some days is terrible. Some days is no fun at all, but you got to do it. So James, what a pleasure talking to you. Congratulations on everything. Absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. So that's it. That's my conversation with James Byrne. Um, you can check out his latest book, The Gatekeeper, a thriller, um, which sounds awesome. I, and I highly encourage you to go read about it. You know, if you want to find out more about The Gatekeeper or, or James, just go to his website, which is just jamesburnthriller.com. And if you want to find out more about me, go to my website, carterwilson.com. There you can sign up for my newsletter, see what events I'm going to be at, uh, all that good stuff. And of course, watch other episodes of Making It Up. They're all on my website. Uh, so that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this one. I know I did. Uh, more episodes coming out soon. In the meantime, thanks for watching and listening. Take care. Thank you.